Patrick Johnson, you chortle. Uh, I'm just I'm thinking about Saturday and how it worked for me and JJ Adams that he got to cover the fun game and I got oh, to cover the game. Oh, I saw that. Game. Yes. Well, you got a lot of goals too, just yeah, in the Vancouver Whitecaps net. Yeah, that was a bad trade. Um, you didn't have to leave your home though. That's the good. No, neither of you did, I guess. No. No, oh, both actually did it remotely. But anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Hey, hey, hey Nathan Rourke. I mean, I price of, you know, he's the, what, what's he's worth the price of admission, right? I mean, uh-huh. every night out, I mean, it was our old pal, Brooke Ward said, was that the most exciting game since blah? I couldn't even remember. And I right. had a, as I said in my tweet, I had this memory of this action Jackson game where he scored four touchdowns, but then I thought the touchdowns had been in the fourth quarter, but it turned out he had all his touchdowns by halftime. So it wasn't quite the full game experience. I mean, that's how amazing the guy's playing right now and how exciting Saturday's experience was for Lions fans. Well, uh, people forget they, they did have an exciting playoff win over Winnipeg there with Jonathan Jennings uh, a few years back. Yeah. Uh, it was a, it was a terrific, and in fact, that is their only postseason victory since winning the 2011 Grey Cup. So, you know, that was my uh, response is since that playoff win uh, against Winnipeg. But as Blake outlined yesterday, you know, at one point we were spoiled here with all the league best players we had with the Canucks and with the Lions and, you know, even some, you know, wonder goal, goal of the year candidates with the Whitecaps. And, you know, then we went through the desert a little bit in terms of, you know, Boy, talent, and ever. and yeah. uh, now here's Rourke uh, as the standard bearer for the CFL. And th- I, just on that point, I think that that is something that I found myself interesting. Like, I think that that is such a driving force to people's reactions. I think to all the teams, but like the Canucks, for instance. You know, you sort of hear the sort of I think the current management group being a bit surprised at how people are reacting. It's like, well, do you guys understand how things have been, both how good things were and how completely lost the things have been before you this new group showed up i mean that's something that i keep thinking about in terms of trying to understand you know their reaction to what people are reacting to and it's yeah like, we are the product of our experience <laughs> yeah like the, you know it's like, been insane yes <laughs> that that's where it is and you know in the end that's forever that's again that's been this we've talked about this before but that's been the story with the lions and certainly that's been the story with the right weight caps in in recent seasons uh have you been watching the juniors? I know you've been uh, deep in the throes of the British Columbia wilderness, but have you been watching the juniors? What do you make of Connor Bedard? And do you think he will reach Connor McDavid's level? I think it's unfair to compare anybody to Connor McDavid, but Connor Bedard is a heck of a player. There is absolutely no doubt about it. Um, I have, I'm going to be honest. I haven't watched a ton of the juniors this summer, but you know, from what I've seen of him before, an exceptional talent and and a, a player that is very much a product of the, the sort of complicated success story, I would say, that we've been having in hockey in, in, in British Columbia and in the lower mainland. I mean, we are producing a lot of talented young players. Um, there's a lot of, obviously, money behind that sort of development across the board. I mean, there's a lot of kids that never make it that are actually helping them along the way because the quality of, you know, you think about the BC major, um, major midget, major bantam stuff, all, all, all the stuff that's setting up players getting in before they get into uh, junior hockey, if they're going the junior hockey route, you know, the, 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 the course has been good and we've been producing, you know, it used to be, we were good at sort of pulling together sort of scrappy mid tier kind of guys. Every once in a while, you get a Joe Sackick, you get a Rod Brindamore, um, and then we had that run of defensemen highlighted by, I guess, like Shea Weber and, and, and guys like that. But yeah, the, this run of forwards has been really impressive. And Bedard is just the latest example. And in, I guess the best one is he is an exceptional player. It didn't, it didn't dawn on me that he could be this special. Uh, I think I was sizest a little bit, um, but you know, I've, you know, McDavid is a, is a bigger guy. And so I just, I bought, I bought that he could be a more complete player but the more Bedard shows us about the lethalness of his shot and his ability to get around the ice too, um, I'm becoming convinced. Especially when you see the you know the years in the last ten years of guys you know under five eleven that have done just fine. Yeah, I mean, I can see I can see the comparison points and why people do that. But in the end, you know, you say can you be Connor McDavid? Is yeah, it's so off the charts. Um, can you be Braden Point? I mean, that's still pretty good. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You talk about a little guy that gets around, and does a lot. I mean, Braden Point had to improve his skating. That was some of his story. But, but yeah, it, it's a league that 
despite all our frustrations and all the stuff that we go on about correctly about officiating and the lack of enforcement and some of the pressures that the referees feel from above um it still is a game that is allowing young players to thrive or sorry small players to thrive and then that's that is a good thing and Connor bedard i mean you think about this 20 years ago would Connor bedard really have been able to develop the way he's developed not only was the de- i mean okay not only was the development um programs available to him not what they are now but the game you, know, you just think I, I, that example i think i've mentioned before that i talked about in that in 90 in 05 06 when they've really cracked down on obstruction and darren hatcher reached out and grabbed, I think, probably a Sedin in the corner and was immediately whistled for it. And all of a sudden, he had this look on his face. You're like, wait, I can't do that anymore. And, you know, in that era, a player like Bedard would not be able to survive. I don't know. Conor McDavid might have struggled to, to survive um, just because of the way that those two are, or the way McDavid's successful and the way Bedard's trying to be successful. I, it's, it is a great thing. He is a reminder of where things are at, like I said, in terms of the top end of the game. And I hope we see more guys like him. Here's why I think it's a fair comparison uh, with McDavid is because like with Connor McDavid, where it was the Buffalo Sabres, we have a team tanking this year for Connor Bedard, and they are the Chicago Blackhawks. No, the Chicago Blackhawks had some young players here, Dabrinkit, Doc, and, and they've traded them. They've decided this is the year we're going to tear it down, and part of that calculation is the opportunity to get a crack at Connor Bedard. Um, you know, I realize he's very young. Um you know, if you don't want these sorts of comparisons, then have a 20-year-old draft like the NFL does, not an 18-year-old draft. Uh, but Lafleur, Lemieux, or Lafleur, Gretzky, Lemieux, Lindros, Crosby, McDavid, to me, he's next in that pantheon. You know, to me, he is the natural successor to take the torch, if I can steal the phrase. No? Sure. I've just, like I said, I just go with the, it's tough to compare a player with the absolute top and I mean, goodness knows I work at a place that made that mistake with poor Tyler Benson. So uh, oh, I, I just boy. caution. Yeah. <laughs> Did you? Was there, not a, was there not a Gilbert Brule headline once upon a time as well? Hey, Maybe? that's before my um, time, so I okay. can't comment. I, I was there for Benson and I'll own that. I mean, that wasn't. Wasn't my idea, but I will, I will, uh, I will stand up and take the bullets for that. I, I think if the I'm bigger mistaken, error is calling him Gilbert. <laughs> Who? Gilbert. Even even Bono got that right. Yeah. Um, even Bono, good line. Uh, What's it in Gilbert Brule? Gilbert uh, Brule. Gilbert Brule. Um, okay, I'm all sixes and sevens now. Oh, <laughs> JT Miller. Who? Oh yeah, that guy. <laughs> uh, have you heard of him? You may have heard him. He was on a podcast recently. Yeah. He's sick of talk about himself. Uh, he thinks he's been traded to Pittsburgh 20 sometimes. <laughs> um, so the agent mused, and you know, perhaps it was just the Rick Dollywall question about whether they would cut off any kind of extension talks at training camp, which of course very much falls in line with what we've seen from other players and agents in the past where they just want to focus on the season right and not be distracted by any of the contract talks. Um would you believe it if they fall through on that? Do you think it's wise for them? What does it mean for the Vancouver Canucks if JT Miller isn't talking contract once the season begins? I mean, I, I, I don't think there's any kind of fourth option, if you will. Not even third option, but let alone four, fourth option. I mean, uh, unless the, the only thing that could possibly change, I suppose, is somehow they clear up more cap space and the Canucks decide, okay, yeah, we're willing to come towards the player. But I think they've been pretty clear from the beginning. This is what we're going to, we, we would like to pay you. And that has been acknowledged by everyone as being very different from what Miller's camp is interested in. And um, I, in the end, I, you know, I mean, I, I get, I understand the idea of not wanting to negotiate during the season. I, I'm always hesitant when sort of, firm deadlines are set because yeah. especially this early because in the end things could change but i just like i said the the numbers are there they know what the numbers are and unless someone's gonna break uh perhaps unexpectedly i just don't think there's anything else that happens and maybe it comes to a certain point where 
the players just like it's not going to happen it's now on you guys you guys can figure it out because for from miller's standpoint he clearly thinks he's going to get that number in free agency so if the canucks don't deliver it then he just sits and says okay fine trade me whatever i don't really care i mean it, that that is the reality of modern we like to think these guys are here you know forever but like they also are rational act- thinkers in this and they're going to be like I think I'm going to get paid. And if I'm not going to get paid, I'm going to get paid somewhere else. And that maybe that means that you guys have to break up that team. And from his standpoint, it's like, that'd be dumb because I think we can win the Stanley cup. Um, but uh, well, you'd know, be th- silly not to get the warning though, from the cadre camp, you know, cause Kadri's right. age is, is comparable to what Miller will be at UFA. You'd be silly not to look at that and say, geez, I hope, I, I hope we're not cadre and wondering where we're going to play. Like a Which, UFA sounds glorious, mm-hmm. right? You sounds like you just walk through the mall and pick and choose what you want, where you want to play. But I don't know that Nazem Kadri would describe that UFA experience quite that way. Which, which I think is in the end what the Canucks are kind of leaning on. Is yeah, going, listen, go. you know, here's our offer. You, it's security. It'll be this is a big number. You'll get it well paid, and we're willing to give it to you. And if you think you know, you think you can go and get a bigger number. Well, look at. John Klingberg, look at Nazem Kadri. Although, um, well, it, when Kadri gets announced here with the Islanders, presumably this week, right? I don't know. Maybe they blow us away, and it's like a really good contract yeah. for for yeah. Nazem Kadri. We don't know. Yeah, entirely. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's the thing. I, that's that is the element in, all, in that comparison that I want to see. Is I want to actually see. Okay, what's the number? What did, what did they actually do there? Yeah. Mm. Um, want your two cents on our poll yesterday, our Bodog poll question yesterday, only because it got huge uh, response. And because there are so many good answers to the toughest Vancouver Canuck of all time. We put Brashear, Rippon, Tiger, and Gino on the poll, but there were a ton of write-in candidates. Um, And, of course, as many respondents said, some of it is a little bit on how you define toughness. So I'll leave that open to you, my friend, but... (laughs) Toughest Canuck Sammy ever. Sallow. What says he? <laughs> <laughs> well, the general and the Italian yeah. there were awfully tough in that one yeah. playoff series, as you recall. Uh, what says you, PJ? Uh, well, I mean, the instinct, of course, is Gino. And, you know, health-wise, I think he gets extra credit. Is that how we put it? I'm not even sure. After school um, credit, yes. Yeah, yeah after school credit. Um I did actually find myself wandering to sort of Ron DeLorme. He was always sort of put up as being that hard edge guy. Garth Butcher forever was that, you know, was sort of thought as the toughest guy in the eighties. And then Gino showed up and took over. I, I um, and, Butcher you know, with the name to boot. And I believe second all time on the list of penalty minutes for the Canucks. I used to, when I just, that used to do that when I was a kid. I was like, how oh, is this half? The tough How's defenseman's it? name exactly. is Butcher. Exactly. Like, yeah. like, I know. I know. It's just the, you know, you're a rugged defenseman. What's your name? Garth Butcher. Like it's straight out of central. Well, from Cats. a kid from out of town, I just knew the Canucks had a guy named Tiger and, <laughs> and Butcher. Butcher. And I was like, I don't want to face the Canucks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, and I'm just going through some of the replies here. Yeah, I mean, people are sort of trying to remember Craig Cox was one of the two heavyweights. Well, oh, Craig Cox boy. also oh. couldn't really play hockey, so yeah. no. I mean, it, Craig Cox yeah, was the so, one guy though that I thought like I, I know there was the the showdown there with Ty Domi, but Craig Cox was the one guy that I thought could measure up to Probert. Uh, well, and those, yeah, I mean, those those clips are crazy. I mean, I'm not a fighting fan. I'm not. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not a fan of fighting in hockey, but those clips are wild. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it's Gino. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's just, he just, he just so changed the sort of neat notion of the team. I mean, it, 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 and he was such a good hockey player. And I mean, I wrote that story about him going, player, yeah, yeah, yeah no, it, Gino could play, you know, absolutely. like I wrote that story of him going into the BC Sports Hall of Fame and earlier this summer. And, and that was one of the things that stood out. And everybody I talked to was just, you know, this, first of all, sort of, the, you know, I, I, Fortunate to come up in a family that I think really were tight, you know, in amongst some very difficult times as in a First Nations community. Um, and then, but then to find success the way he did and, 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 you know, fought his way, but to also play. And that was the thing that people all said, you know, everyone said the thing people don't realize first guys way, way smarter than anybody ever gave him perhaps credit for. And two, could he could play like he, the 16 goals he scores playing with Beret are not a fluke. I mean, obviously Beret helps a lot, but he still had to put the puck in the net, you know? Um, 
and and he was always I mean, always trying to sort of make himself a bit more than what people perceived him to be in that era, which was that he got dropped the gloves. So anyway, Gino's my vote. And I I mean, the fact Gino comes up and says hello to me obviously biases my vote. Like I, I don't oh, quite okay. believe that. There you go. Well. <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you for disclosing your bias after we put yeah. you through the ringer asking you to compare 17 year olds, 16 year olds <laughs> to modern stars and about fighting in hockey. Shame on us, PJ. <laughs> Do you have a palate cleanser for him on the way out, Blake, or are we yes, just I done do. here? Okay. Uh, I want him to about, be sour with us. You know, the lingering story in Ottawa, we've got our JT Miller lingering story right. here. The, the, the lingering story in Ottawa this summer is Jacob Chikrin. Uh, who granted is a left side defenseman or rather than the apple of everybody's eye, which is the right side, which would mm. maybe bring the Canucks into it. But I'm just surprised because he is a good value contract. And I've said on numerous times in the show, I don't think he's a spectacular defenseman. I think he's a very good one um, because he doesn't provide any offensive push, really. Um, I'm surprised that the Canucks, like, I, I don't think I've ever heard the Canucks tied to Jacob Chikrin over either of the administrations, but enlighten me on, uh, on if there's been much of a of a kick of the tire. Well, I mean, I think in the end, you go back to the draft, and we do, we do know how that draft went, right? I mean, <laughs> Yule Levy goes at five because they really, Jim Benning especially, really liked his performance at the World Championships. Um, you know, the, the year that the, the, the I mean, there's that Mike Russo interview with Judd Brackett where Brackett himself basically lays out it was so chaotic trying to run that draft that Trevor Linden puts his foot down and says, no, Judd is in charge and he will guide us. And in the end, they had the consensus agreement that Pedersen was the guy they really wanted to get uh, a year later, and that worked. But in that you know 2016 year, we it was a mess. And in the end, Benning really... I mean, the first, over, the first round pick has traditionally been the GM's call. I mean, I think in the end, that was... That's a lot of the story was that it was up to Benning, um, but drafted Yule Levy, I think above slot, basically everyone would say, certainly says now, but certainly even then at the time, I remember people saying, wow, they probably, if they were going to sit in five, they really should have gone for something like Sergeyev. Um, but there were guys behind and J Chikrin was one of them. And I remember, you know, people having some excitement about sort of the, clean, the sort of clean game he plays and the kind of guy that you could get, especially if you were willing to drop back and, you look at the trio of players, um, there's three defensemen that go early in the teens. You've got Jake Bean, you've got Charlie McAvoy, you've got Jacob Chikrin. Um, all guys that, you know, if 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 Benning had been willing to trade back, which apparently he wasn't, you could have still gotten. Or he probably still could have gotten his guy, Levy. So th that's the thing. Yeah. Chikrin in the end, I mean, my understanding is, like having talked to people over the years, is Chikrin and McAvoy were downgraded by Benning and Wisebrod for a variety of reasons, you know, sort of, didn't necessarily like how Chikrin saw the game, had doubts about how he saw the game, which clearly they were wrong on, had doubts about McAvoy's fitness levels. Clearly they were wrong on that. Um, not quite, I mean, I know they were high on Bean. I'm still not quite sure. I mean, Bean obviously hasn't been a terribly big success story, but uh, a, a guy that they really liked, they could have traded back for. There were deals on the table that they could have, you know, probably grabbed two first round today. That It is such a story in, in opportunity costs and what they missed and they grabbed the sort of the most vanilla defenseman of the group and a guy who hasn't panned out, you know, he probably would have played, but for those injuries, but in the end was always a vanilla prospect. And, you know, you looked, they, they, they sort of convinced themselves away from players that were totally fine and clearly have been solid. And if not outstanding NHLers and could probably had two of those guys if they, if they'd been willing to trade back, but for some reason they weren't and they sat there and they took the most boring of the bunch. He's an O's vanilla. I mean, vanilla is palatable, digestible. Uh, a good this, vanilla. A this was rotten vanilla eggs. Bean I mean, this was, uh, yeah, this was unedible. Yeah. This was plain yogurt. I mean, plain don't, no, like, not even that. Was a he, was okay. I mean, he was fine, but he wasn't a fifth overall draft pick. And then he got hurt. Mm -hmm. And that's the yeah. story, is it? You know, and I've heard sort of questions about the overall picture and so on and so on and so on. But mm. They misfired, uh, and they, they and they were never into. And in the end, they were just never interested in getting Chikrin, even though he's a guy that has already built up a solid NHL career, much yeah. more than the guy that they picked was. Welcome back to Wi-Fi connectivity. Thank yeah. you for this. We'll yeah, catch up next you. Tuesday, my friend. Take care, guys.